today. This is going to be an introduction to test equipment by Philip Lawson, Golf 4 Foxtrot Charlie Lima. And it's going to consider typical scenarios that you might need some test equipment and the six most useful items of test equipment that you can buy or have access to. And uh, as an amateur, getting hold of good test equipment is always a challenge. So uh, I'll pass over to you. Thank you, Philip. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to consider what test equipment might, what we might need test equipment for. Uh, I've ident identified six of the most uh, important types of test equipment in my view. You see what you see what you think. Uh, a mention of a brief mention of test equipment you can make, uh, and think also encouraging you to think about what you need because there's a trade-off between what you might need, what you might want, and how much, it is, how much the test equipment costs. And a few tips along the way in terms of using the, uh, the equipment. So uh, starting at the very basics, what do we use test equipment for? For fault finding, uh, we've got a bit of equipment, it doesn't work. Uh, oh, there's a problem with connection, that's fair enough. But then we might have to delve inside and um, find uh, uh, what's wrong. And it's very rare that there's a little man with a flag saying, look, the, the problem's here, you've got you've to locate it, which can be quite time consuming and hard work and needs a bit of skill to do. We might use test equipment for characterization. Um, if you've built something, you might want to check its frequency, you, you might want to look at the uh, um, gain frequency response, uh, and you might need to uh, align the piece of equipment. So the first and most useful thing that hopefully we've all got at home is the, the multimeter. Um, it's the most amazing item. It measures uh, resistance, inductance, capacitance, temperature, humidity. Uh, it might, measure, might uh, uh, measure a frequency, it might have a built-in pulse uh, oscillator. Um, it's, it's really good for the very basic uh, things. If you want to measure capacitance, for example, uh, some of the modern multimeters do, but it's over a very limited range. Uh, for 10 to 50 pounds, that's uh, it's it's a, a, a remarkable uh, bit of kit given its capability. Um, so that is that is really if you're you're new to the hobby, that is a that is absolutely must must have. Um, I want to put a plug in for the um, the analog multimeter. Um, don't write it off because very often. Uh, uh, you, you, you want to measure a voltage really accurately, but then at the same time, you may want to measure the supply current. If it's uh, an audio amplifier, in a receiver or in a transmitter, the, the current's varying slowly. And that's where the, anal the old analog multimeter is really, really good, because you can't follow uh, a, a moving signal very easily on a, on a digital multimeter. So the analog multimeter is really good for that. And hey, it's got, it's got a big, it's got a big a uh, moving coil meter and a knob, and what's what's not to like? <laughs> uh, I think that one cost uh, sixty. That analog multimeter cost sixty nine pound, sixty nine, sixty nine shillings and sixpence, uh, which is just under three pound fifty in new money, uh, which translates to about sixty pounds in modern terms. And if you look at the functionality from the modern DMM compared to the old scalar um, multimeter. Um, it's uh, you know it's really good value for money. Uh, the other thing I forgot to say was that the the modern DMM, as well as not being able to uh, uh, follow um, uh, ch changes very easily, um, it may be susceptible to uh, noise and RF. And again, the, uh, the old analog multimeter can be can be your friend in those circumstances to find out what's what's really going on. Uh, so let's move off a little bit. So a component tester, uh, really useful bit of kit. Now you may say, well, why do I want one of those when I've got a multimeter? Um, yes, it, it measures resistance and it, it will measure capacitance. It will measure capacitance to a, often to a, uh, a higher value than your, your DMM will. Uh, but most importantly, perhaps, it will measure ESR, the effective series resistance, the um, uh, AC resistance, if you will. 
and that can be really useful in determining whether a component is okay or not. Um, you may not be able to read the values there, but on the left-hand side is a 470 micropower capacitor. Um, it's showing a... Uh, I can't read it on here either, but it's about, I think it's showing about 490 uh, micropowers or so, uh, which is well within the tolerance, and the ESR of 0.22 ohms, which is uh, a very low series resistance, which is what you're looking for. On the right-hand side, you see a capacitor there, which has a, an ESR of about just under 7 ohms, and uh, uh, a capacitance is showing is 83 microfarads. What, it do what the slide doesn't tell you is that they are both 470 microfarad capacitors. <laughs> so clearly, the one on the right um, has got a problem. Uh, if you're faced with a circuit that has lots of components in, lots of uh, capacitors, lots of electrolytic capacitors, um, rather than having to take the whole lot out, a, a useful tip is to look across the top of a capacitor. Now, it's hard to see. I know you can't see it from there, but if you look across the top of it, this is a radial capacitor, look at the across the top, um, it should be perfectly flat. This one here um, has got a slight dome on the top, and um, uh, that immediately says, I've got a problem. Uh, and it saves you taking them all out and testing all the capacitors if you can just, just have a look at the top. It's hard to spot, but it, it'll save you a lot of time um, if you're looking for a faulty um, electrolytic capacitor. Uh, so, uh, it will, of course, it will also um, uh, tell you whether your transistors, if you've uh, got three-legged transistors, it will tell you which, com which lead is which, and uh, it tells you the FT and a few useful things like that. For 20 quid, uh, I think that's, uh, that's a bargain. Signal generators. Now, your first thought, my goodness, that's an old signal generator. <sighs> but um, one of the things I want to suggest is that just because something is old, it doesn't mean that it, it's no good. It probably applies to people as well, but there we go. Um, so there's the old uh, Maplin signal generator. And uh, uh, on the right at the top is an old uh, Taylor single generator. The one on the left is from the Maplin one is from the 70s. Uh, the, the, the Taylor one is on, 60, on the 60s. You can see it says to kill the cycles and mega cycles. Remember, remember those? Um, so uh, the thing is, what do you want to do? What do you need? So what about the frequency range? Do you need it to uh, do you need to modulate the signal that you want to uh, use as a test signal? Do you need to control the power? Are you bothered about setting accuracy? Are you bothered about drift? Um, are you bothered about the phase noise on the signal? Do you need uh, digital I and Q outputs? For what I do, and perhaps for what most amateurs need, you may not need uh, something that's uh, things are synthesized, maybe, maybe one of the old test generators will do. Um, I, I look, commonly look at um, um, old radio sets and, and that's those, the stability and the phase noise within reason I'm really not bothered about. And those, uh, you know, a 50 pound signal generator uh, is perfectly adequate. Um, if you need something that's uh, more state of the art, well, something like the Rosen Swartz at the bottom on the right is uh, a few thousand pounds. Uh, I think entry level generators, you're talking about 500,000 pounds or so. Um, it depends what you want to. I suppose all I'm saying is don't, you know, don't pay for more functionality than what you need. If you can afford a, a nice uh, one generator, that's fine. But if you're starting out and uh, you uh, funds are limited uh, or you're squeezed, you know you, you can do a lot with a say a 50 pound single generator. And again, they've got a nice big, nice big dial and a nice big knob, lots of knobs, and they're absolute pleasure to use. And uh, I think uh, one of the things I want to draw out perhaps is that um, 
yeah, this is a hobby. We're meant to be enjoying ourselves, and uh, I would much rather use one of those than something with piddly little buttons on. I mean, I use those at work, and uh, they're all right, but you know, you get enjoyment out of using the, uh, uh, the older e equipment, as long as it, it does what you want it to. The oscilloscope. Um, the, uh, so we need to make measurements in the time domain, particularly if we're working on digital stuff. Um, so a modern scope will tell you things like the peak to peak voltage, the, uh, the pulse width, the rise time, uh, the fall time, uh, all sorts of things. And it will, it'll have little labels and it'll, it will tell you what, uh, what, what these parameters are, give you the actual values. And that's fine. And uh, these, you know, scopes, you can get a nice modern solid state scope for something like 300 pounds or so. Um, and uh, you get a nice desktop or bench top scope for maybe a thousand pounds. But again, do you, do you need that um, you, you, when you can use a, uh, an older scope? I've got m uh, my old Tektronics uh, one here, which I, I sold a few years ago for uh, 50 or 60 quid. Um, <coughs> it won't tell you what the rise time is. You'll have to measure it yourself. But uh, uh, and the pulse width and so on. But uh, you, again, you get a certain amount of enjoyment out of being able to um, uh, to, do, to do the measurements and, and understand what's going on. Take a bit longer, and a bit, and that bit of equipment is a bit heavier than the modern scope. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, it's fifty quid rather than three hundred pounds or thousand pounds. So I just throw that that thought in there. Uh, we're using an older scope, then of course, um, uh, they come with a, um, a a voltage reference which you should use to calibrate the um, uh, the uh, uh, the y axis, the y gain. Um, that's showing 400 volts peak to peak. Um, 400, sorry, 400 millivolts peak to peak. Uh, the reference is 300 millivolts, so I have to alter the, um, the Y gain a little bit and there's a screw next to the, the Y input which needs adjusting. So you should always check the calibration of the scope in the Y direction and in the X direction, the, uh, the time base. Uh, and then you'll be well away. Um, Yes, I should also mention there is. Uh, you'll see on the on the right a uh, the uh, it's a high it's a times ten high impedance probe and it has a screw. That screw is there for a reason, and it's so that you can get a nice square pulse. It just alters the um, the, the tuning in the in the probe to match the uh, capacitance the input capacitance in the uh, the Y amplifier. Uh, if you if you turn it too far one one way, you'll get a slope um, uh, uh, on the the waveform because it will be overdamped. If you turn it too far the other way, it'll be underdamped and you'll get a spike. And you need to adjust it so that you get a nice square waveform if you're doing pulsed measurements. Working our way up to the more more exotic stuff, the spectrum analyzer. Uh, so I don't know how many of you have got a spectrum analyzer at home. Possibly not. Oh, you have. Oh, well done. Okay. Yeah. So they can be really useful because um, you know we've been looking in the time domain with the scope. We're looking at the frequency domain with the um, with the analyzer, uh, it's useful for measuring the level of spurious signals. Um, as you see on the left, I think it's a 10 megahertz signal, and you can see it's the um, uh, the harmonics there, second and third harmonic, um, and uh, you can look for interference, and uh, you can look at modulation as well. That that on the right is uh, 10 megahertz with 
um, 10 kilohertz modulation, I think, at 50%. Um, so it's useful for looking close in. S so if you want to get a spectrum analyzer, how much is it going to cost you? Um, I've come back to cost because in these times, I mean, you know, th this you can you can pay an enormous amount of money for for, for equipment. And the question is, do you do you have to? Do you need to? Uh, there's a thing called a tiny SA, which is on the market now. For uh, I bought one recently for seventy eight pounds. I mean, it doesn't have the functionality of some of the higher end stuff, but it goes from hundred kilohertz to nine hundred sixty megs, and you can see signals in the across that range. Um, issue there of course is that there are a number of phantom signals for mixing products so you do have to be a bit careful that the signal you're looking at is a real signal and not one that's generated in the in test instrument the professional instruments of course do uh, do, do overcome that problem um, so uh, so yeah so a basic analyzer 78 uh, quid if you want to um, get a bench top one and to you're talking over a thousand pounds and uh, you can pay as much as you like um, but it's amazing that you can actually they're, they're starting to become affordable affordable I mean 20 years ago I mean you would not have thought of having a spectrum analyzer in your in your shack unless you you made something that was effectively a spectrum analyzer uh, you do sort of see this sort of thing with an SDR because that's looking at um, signals across the frequency domain. But uh, this is accurately measuring power and you can alter the resolution band rate and you can see you can see a fair way down. So let's go on to uh, the network analyzer. Now I think my first time I used a network analyzer I, I used one that cost about 50k i think and it sat on a trolley <laughs> and we wheeled it about between the laboratories yeah and the astonishing thing is um and i've got one here uh, uh so yeah so a vna a vector network analyzer um because it's an introduction i i i'm i'm bound just to for those who uh not been in the hobby a long time, just to uh, mention what a VNA is, and perhaps for others of you who have not used one. So a VNA, a vector network analyzer, the vector bit comes from the facts. Well, do you remember your schoolboy, schoolgirl, school, schoolboy, schoolboy physics? Um, the scalar quantities and the vector quantities, scalar quantity, magnitude only, vector quantity has magnitude and direction. A vector, in this circumstance, we're talking about the magnitude of the reflection coefficient and its angle. And from that we can infer impedance, uh, we can plot it on a Smith chart, which is what this uh, uh, circular business of rings is, for those who are not familiar. Uh, and we can determine things like VSWR. Uh, so really really useful instrument um, if you look at the yellow and the purple if you can just make out the yellow line the horizontal yellow line almost horizontal yellow line and the slightly sloping vertical um, purple line um, the yellow is the the magnitude uh, of the reflection coefficient and the purple one is the uh, the phase um, what it wha I, uh, basically what it means is that if you if you um, put for example a filter between the two ports on the on the instrument so those SMAs that you see on the bottom of the uh, instrument on the left uh, I can show you okay so if you put a put a filter or or perhaps an amplifier between these two ports you can see what its gain frequency response is and that's you know a really useful thing to know. Um, the other thing you can do is you can use this port uh, on the left, uh, if you look at the photo, um, to uh, look at the impedance. So you could look at the input impedance of an antenna or 
uh, you know, your RF circuit that you just made, uh, it will, um, you should calibrate the um, instrument first. And there are open and short circuits which come with the with the instrument. Uh, and once you've calibrated it, you can then it then enables you to measure the impedance. Um, if you're not familiar with Smith charts and you're interested in RF, then I would encourage you to uh, learn how to use a Smith chart. Really, really useful. I can't go into details of it now, um, but um, uh, you can. This is uh, it shows you normalised impedance. You know, it's relative to 50 ohm usually, and you can plot the impedance on there, and you can, you know, put uh, lengths of transmission line in, and you can see how the impedance moves. And it's a really, really useful thing to know. Uh, uh, and this and this VNA, it it it, um, it, does it, it tells you what the impedance is, which is which is fantastic. Uh, I say it's, it's amazing. You know, so when I started sort out in the hobby, the idea of being able to do this uh, was unthinkable. But now, now you can. You can do it with your uh, instrument at home. Um, so the, the Nano VNA, I, I picked one up for £250. Uh, you, can, you might get one for less. Um, I saw that um, Mike Richards has written a book for the ISGB on that, so uh, telling you how to use it, which, which might, be, it might be useful if you're um, interested. So let's go to making your own you so you can you can make your own instruments uh here uh, here's one i made earlier i made this uh let me see now I made this 50 years ago and i still use it and it's got two transistors two capacitors four resistors uh a screw crocodile clip bit of wire and the top end of a cigar container uh, and it produces square faults uh, uh, of a few kilohertz for testing audio amplifiers and stuff. Uh, or you could just go out and buy buy something like the, um, the thing on the right, signal injector. Um, that's an old one, but you can you know you can you can get them easily. Uh, and a signal tracer. So the idea being there that you put a signal into the RF circuit from your signal generator and you trace the signal through uh, and, and you know where it is and where it isn't and the difference between where it is and where it isn't is where the fault is. So that's, <laughs> that's all there is to it. <laughs> uh, so just to sum up really, uh, if you're buying, you've got more functionality per pound than ever before. But you need to think to yourself, what do I need? What's the specification? You know, what's what's the frequency range? Uh, what stability do I need, and so on? Uh, what's the cost? Is it nice to use? Again, you know, it's a hobby. You should be you should enjoy using your test equipment, and the more you know about test equipment, the the, the more enjoyment you get from it. Um, so the ergonomics are important. Uh, if you're buying, of course, the condition, if it's second hand, just check that out. Uh, if you're buying new, look at the user reviews, what the, what the users think about it. Have they, have they found it, um, have they found that particular product uh, useful to them? See what they say. Right, now, I've put this in red. Keep the manual. Now, oh, keep the manual. Why do I? <laughs> my first, my first thought when I get a piece of equipment is to, is to take it straight out, and plug it in, and try it. And I couldn't care less about what the document says, but the document is actually really, really important because you need to know um, what is the max in the case of a uh, spectrum analyzer, for example. What is the maximum signal I can put into it? Uh, if it's a multimeter, what is the maximum voltage I can put on it? All sorts of things. So the manual is your friend. You, you won't need it very often, but, but the chances are you want to do a measurement 
and you think, where did I put the manual? How have I still got it? And if I've got it, um, uh, I need to spend two hours trying to find it. So keep the manual and keep it near the test equipment. Um, make sure the instrument is calibrated. That's less of a problem with solid state stuff because it tends not to drift so much. Uh, and uh, think about maximum input levels. I don't know if I'm the only one, but uh, I've, I've blown up multimeters by putting too much current through them. Um, I do know of people who put uh, 30 dBm into a spectrum analyzer and then realize that the maximum input power to a 10,000 pound spectrum analyzer is only plus 10 dBm. And um, so you know, that's 100 times more than uh, what they should. Uh, so that they, they weren't very popular. Uh, a bit embarrassing. So, 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 so protect your equipment, equipment and, and have the keep the keep the manual to hand. If it's a multi, if it's a multi, then it's probably just a, a, a simple piece of paper in pidgin English that tells you what the um, what all the different ranges are. Uh, if it's something a bit more exotic, you might have a a, few, uh, 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 a little booklet or something. But uh, but do keep it and, and keep it somewhere near where you where you work. Uh, uh, I always say this, the, the process is see, think, do, um, to avoid making mistakes. And your understanding of the equipment, uh, I think, uh, will be, uh, will be uh, rewarded. So that's it, really. Um, there, is a, there is a book that goes to the slides. <laughs> uh, test equipment for radio amateur, and that's in the... Uh, in the, in the bookshop, and that deals obviously with, with more complex measurements. I've just this is really just meant to be an introduction for those who are uh, perhaps not familiar with particular types. So that's it from me, and I think we go to questions now, if, uh, if that's possible. The gentleman here. Hi. Um, thanks, Philip. Um, very interesting. Uh, my name is Mike uh, G4 CDF. Um, I'll share with you what I think. Um, when, I re when I retired, I o already had a, a, a multimeter and scope, as you recommended. That, mm. That's the standard stuff. Mm. Uh, but as a retirement present to myself, I bought a Regal tracking generator plus spectrum analyzer. goes up to 1,500 megahertz. It's absolutely the best of, of everything. It, it, it's so useful. It's the most used bit of test kit in the in the shack. Um, a few years ago, I built an N2PK vector network analyzer. It's homebrew, so you can buy boards. It costs a fortune to, to make, but it's brilliant as well. Only goes up to 60 megahertz generally, but it's a lot better than the nano VNA, put it that way. Oh. <laughs> um, other things I'd recommend are um, a set of SMA attenuators, fixed attenuators, invaluable. If you can pick them up at a junk sale, buy them. Uh, make sure they're in good condition, but you know, they're really useful. And a set of dummy loads, you oh. know, high power dummy loads, and then make everything else yourself. Because once you've got the spectrum analyzer with tracking generator, you've got a calibrated source that's, you don't need signal generator, the, the, vec, uh, the, the tracking generator acts as a signal generator if you want one. Yeah. Um, you can do everything else yourself, virtually. Gosh, yes. And that's what I've done. I haven't spent that much money, <laughs> uh, you know. And, and indeed, don't bother buying anything above 1500 megahertz because if you go to a junk sale and buy some mixers, I've bought some high frequency, really high frequency mixers, you can buy a Chinese oscillator that goes up to 4.4 gigahertz, you can buy a couple of those or some amplifiers and so on and make yourself a frequency extender for the analyzer that will go up to tens of gigahertz if you want to. Yes. That's my thoughts. Uh, well, th th thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, I take my hat off you for, uh, for being able to uh, build that equipment and, uh, and, and, get it working. and, and that, that's tremendously useful. Um, tracking generators can be uh, really useful. Um, I was, um, I'd like to have, um, I haven't, I'm going to get a bit of spare time, which is, is very rare, but I'd quite like to build a, a wobble later, because um, for, for checking IF strips, a wobble later, a wobble later is a, um, it will tune 
um, over over the IF, you know, you know like um, 450 to 470 kilohertz, something like that. Uh, similar sort of thing at 1.6 megs, and you can see the gain frequency response. And you would have thought, you would have thought you could just go out and buy a wobblator, and uh, but sadly, no. Um, I think you can make a fortune if you if you if you built one and sold them. But there we go. Uh, but uh, but thank you. That's 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 really interesting. Yes. Anybody else? No. Okay. Well, thank you once again, Philip. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>